Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for taking the time out to join me today. Today, I am talking about something very near and dear to my heart, something very important to me. It's a My Child Care Center's program model. And so um, it really started coming up for me a lot last week. And a lot of times when I choose what to talk to you about, it's really fueled by you guys, the messages I'm getting, the comments when you guys tag me in posts, uh, emails that I receive, just so many of you guys asking me questions and asking me for help really instigates a lot of what I choose to do. Well, lately I've had other coaches ask me for help, other childcare coaches and approach me asking me to help them. And I'm always happy to help. I have a huge passion. And, and you know what, while I tell you guys this, I'll introduce myself for those of you who are new to my channel. Um, my name is Evelyn Knight. I am the host of the Child Care Business Coach podcast, soon to be Child Care Business Professionals. We're trying to make my branding all one name at this point. And I am also the owner of Child Care Business Professionals, which is a company that helps owners and directors find success while achieving high quality research based standards. I am also a child care center owner. And uh, that research based standards is what we're going to talk about today. I always talk about how I help owners and directors achieve high quality, right? And I'm a business coach. So I help owners with their business side. But what's most important to me and where my passion really lies is in that quality piece for the children. Um, I say it over and over and over. And some of you who watch all my, I get emails from you guys like, I've seen all your videos. I listened to all your podcast episodes. If you are one of those people, you've heard me say it over and over again. My mission in life is to make sure all children have the opportunity to attend a high quality research-based standard program, right? Regardless of their socioeconomic status. But what does that mean? Um, so that's why when other child care coaches reach out to me, who, you know, many of you might think, well, that's your competition. Why would you help them? It's because I'm on a mission. And one of my missions is to change 10,000 owners lives, right? And directors, because if I can change 10,000 directors and owners lives, and those 10,000 have a staff of 10, it means I've just changed the lives of 100,000 people who are touching how many children, right? And if that 100,000 teachers touches just 10 children each, think about it. I've hit a million children's lives. So that's why I put out so much free content. I do so much of what I do because I'm on a mission to help all children. And it's interesting. My company actually has an international customer base. So I do touch people all over the world. But my main goal is those high quality standards. And I understand that we got to get the business fixed, right? And so I kind of see it as twofold, where we have to get the business in line, we have to fix the business part of things. And then we have to fix the classrooms, we have to get your program up to that standard, right? So when for my clients, the way I work with you is I help you with your program management, I help you learn how to run a business. What do you do when a employee is constantly calling in for the silliest things, right? Or just how do you onboard new hires? Um, and I can tell you it's, it's much more in depth. But for those of you who don't understand, it, I started the very basics, but most of you guys don't even know how to onboard a new hire. But after that, once you get that down, what I really try to focus on is now let's work on your classrooms. Now let's bring your classrooms to the highest quality period. And that's why I don't mind working with other coaches, because I know that if it is good for ECE, if it is makes the early childhood education environment better, then I will do whatever it takes. I will help my competition raise up to higher levels, right? I will promote them. I will do whatever it takes as long as we are aligned when it comes to quality, right? Um, that is the thing. If they are doing making centers better for the children, then that helps me fulfill my life's purpose, basically what God put me here for. So I had this conversation with uh, some people this weekend, and there's a couple different coaches in the um, and you guys know Prana Richards. I'm working with her a lot. She is amazing when it comes to just classroom management and her passion for ECE is very aligned with mine. And I actually was talking to somebody different though this weekend who was asking me that they're really good at the business end of things, but they didn't quite get those 
quality standards things. And you guys, before I go on, make sure you give StreamYard permission so I can see your comments, um, whether you're on YouTube watching or Facebook. Hi, there's Prana. Good morning. But um, yes, Prana and I are very, very, very well aligned, which is why I love working with Prana. She, um, and Prana is a great example of a coach that I'm absolutely willing to just lift her up and help her become successful because her vision aligns so beautifully with mine. So Prana, I'm so glad you're on today because I am talking today about why quality is so important. Saturday, I had a conversation with, um, another person who I'm helping. And she was just trying to understand, she doesn't really the business end of things, but she doesn't really work in the classrooms. And so when I was trying to explain to her, she asked me, why is that part so important? She said, you know, I'm a business coach. I help these child care centers get up, but I'm always hearing you talk about the classroom quality. And she's like, and that is just so important. Why is that? Why is, and I'll tell you what it, what it really comes down to is I really, the Americanized ECE system is something that I just don't, I, I it, it's wonderful, better than K through 12, but we can do better. And so a lot of owners and directors don't even really understand what quality needs to be. And trying to explain it, it's so hard to summarize the big picture of what really needs to happen. And Prana is a great example. The work Prana does when she gets into a classroom and really just helps you build up these classrooms to have the highest quality possible, it encompasses so much. It, it, it just is so all encompassing that it's really hard to summarize that work, right? And so I was trying to think of a way, and I and if you guys read my post, I posted a little bit about this on my Facebook, but I was trying to think of a way, how can I explain to you to this person who is just a business coach that don't have an ECE background, what it means to the children, to your program, right? To have high quality research-based standards. And this is basically, uh, if you read my post, you guys kind of know where I'm going, but I want to really elaborate to you and talk to the ECE community because I meet so many owners and directors who don't understand and know this. But 90% of the brain is forming in the first five years of life. Okay. So the person that we become, our characters, our integrity, uh, our time management, our coping skills, uh, our reasoning, our uh, just how we get along with others, um, that all happens in the first five years of life. So I hear so much of you guys talking about like this staff member you're dealing with and they just can't do this. They can't do that. Um, and it just makes me like those traits, the, the lack of time management, the ones who fall apart and just start crying over everything and who can't cope or the ones who can't get along as a team, all of that happened because they didn't have a quality program before they were five years old. I mean, really think that in. The, when I first realized this, when I, re, I was very young, and but I was already working in ECE. Um, I was an infant toddler director for a center. When I first really, this concept really sunk into my brain and I just realized, oh my gosh, we have such a huge responsibility just such a huge responsibility on our hands because we are basically helping this little child form their personality. And there is that nature versus nurture, right? There is who we're born as, you know, we have the nature that what we're born as, right? And then there's the nurture part of who we are. What we're doing is creating that nurture part. So for those of you who don't really know nature versus nurture, right? There is like who we are to the core, who we were born as, who we are innately, our temperament. That, that doesn't change. It is who we are. But the nurture part is who we can nurture children to become, right? And so that 90% of your brain is what we should be focusing on in ECE. But the commercialized system and what honestly commercialization has done to early childhood education is we've kind of gotten away with, from that. We're so not all of them. I mean, a high quality programs, organizations like NACI, um, the, if you're part of your quality stars program, they really are focusing on that brain development, which is where we should be. But if you're not, and you don't believe in that stuff, 
If you believe that putting your children in your child care center in front of ABC Mouse is not doing them a service, it's not. It's really, really doing them a disservice. It's really not doing what's best for the child. And you're not helping them grow to be the best version of themselves, right? Which is what we should be doing. We should be helping nurture the parts of their brain that are actually developing and growing so that when they do get to kindergarten, when they get to the third grade, when they get to the seventh grade, when they're in college, they have the tools that they need to be the best version of themselves so that they understand problem solving, right? So when they have a ton of assignments, they know how to prioritize. They know how to manage their time. They have these great problem solving and they can discern what needs to be done, right? Um, when you, and, and yes, you guys, we are responsible for that. It is a huge responsibility, but what we are giving the children now is going to determine their future for the rest of their lives. I really want you guys to think about that. Those children may never remember who we are. They, you can walk by them in the store and they may never remember you. I, my um, first child I worked with is actually graduated from Purdue University, right? And I know if he walked by me now, he wouldn't know who I am, but I did make an impact on that boy's life that is going to be with him forever, right? It, it's, he may not remember my name. He may not remember the times I read to him to put him to sleep. He may not remember the puzzles I did with him, but the impression I left in his life will never go away. And that is what we do in ECE. Our work is the most important work. We are setting the foundation, the building blocks for these children's brains, which is why quality is so, so important, you guys. I cannot stress to you. Um, I love doing research on different EC models around the world. And uh, everybody knows Raggio Emilia from Italy, right? Which is one of the best you can possibly do. But there is a better model out there. If you guys research Finland's preschool model, they are the number one. Um, so Finland altogether has the number one um, outcomes in the world when it comes to education, period. By the time children get to college, their uh, high school graduation rate, rates, all of it, they outperform every nation in the world. And they give credit to their early childhood education system. And I'm just, I'm not going to get too into it, but I'm just going to give you guys one fun fact about Finland. In Finland, it is actually against the law to teach a child how to read before the age of seven. Just think about that. We are pushing our three-year-olds right? We push a three-year-old to learn how to read. But in Finland, whose children outperform ours, I mean, they run circles around ours. The United States is 33 in the world for quality. Finland is number one, okay? And they don't allow their children to learn how to read till the age of seven. Why is that? Why is it where with our perspective here in the United States, we automatically start thinking, um, well, our kids should be way ahead of them. My kid's been reading four years longer than that child. But the problem is, is that we are forcing the brain into a situation that they weren't ready for. And, um, and you guys, my background's in neuropsychology. I'm not going to get too technical. I could get really technical here. So I'm going to keep it very, uh, I, I do tend to, if I get on one of my rants, so I'm not going to keep it very technical, but I could tell you guys that basically all they're doing is memorizing when you're sitting there showing them flashcards and showing things like that, it is no different. If you're sitting there with a poster and teaching your kids ABCs with a poster, right? And you're pointing to A, B, C every day, that is no different than teaching them old McDonald has a farm by using flashcards. There is no difference. You're not teaching them anything. They are not learning. If you're teaching kids how to count by just saying one, two, three, Three, you might as well be teaching them how to sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. It's a term called rote learning. And that they're not learning. They're not learning. That's why, oh, I see somebody wrote, and I'm sorry if you didn't give um, uh, StreamYard permission. I can't see who you are, but I do see someone that said play is best. Yes, play is absolutely best. That's why my center is play-based. That's why it is neurologically based. I follow the child's growth trajectory of their brain, right? And that's why like, if you give them, you know, like counting bears, for example, and show them, look, here's three, one, two, three, 
that is when they really, really learn. But that doesn't happen with flashcards. It doesn't happen in front of ABC Mouse. That happens when you play with the children, when you get in there and you facilitate that learning, right? When you're actually, um, and let's see, hold on for science readings to uh, fast trickle down. Yes, absolutely. It just really, um, yeah, science, there's a lot we can do, but what I want you guys to think about is think in terms of play. Like if you guys watched my enrollment video I did for you guys, um, I talked about how I do show parents science um, in my classroom when the children are making Play-Doh, right? The children make our own Play-Doh. We don't buy Play-Doh. They make it every week. And what we do is um, we explain to them while they're making it, right? They can see you've got a liquid substance with a dry substance. What happens when they come together? That is science, right? And they are really learning instead of just sitting there and lecturing. Uh, one thing I always tell my tours is I ask them all the time, do you remember, what do you remember from your high school science class or history class? And most people laugh and say nothing, right? I said like when the child, when your teacher lectured, just sat there and lectured, do you remember any of that? No, none of us do. None of us remember a lecture, right? But what we do remember is that science teacher who brought in the stuff to make. Did you make volcanoes? I had a science teacher who we live out in the desert and we had fields across the street from my high school. He would take us out into the field and he actually had us go and learn the e ecosystem by taking us out there into just this dirt field and finding the bugs and the lizards and stuff like that. And then he showed us the correlation. I never forgot that. I'm, you know, I'm not going to tell you guys how many years it's been, but I remember that because it was hands-on learning. Same thing with ECE, but it's even more powerful for the early childhood brain. Um, that's just, just even more powerful. The other issue or aspect I was telling this other coach about is behavior, right? That is the other thing. A high quality program doesn't expel children. We don't kick children out of our program. I have never kicked a single child out of my preschool programs. All the preschool programs I've ever owned, never. I have had to kick parents out. I will say that um, I have kicked parents out, but never the child. And what it, the reason that is, is because when you have, when you understand human behavior, right, and you understand where these children are coming from, you tend to understand why their behaviors are off and you can help facilitate them to learn how to behave. We as humans, we are not born knowing how to behave. Human behavior is learned. And for those of you, if you've never taken an anthropology class, you may not realize, but the only really thing that is innate in all humans is that we smile, we laugh, things like that, right? But a lot of the things that we think should just be, children should be born with, that is cultural. It is not normal, right? It is not what we're just born with. Children are not born knowing they can't hit. Children are not born knowing that biting hurts. It is our job to teach it. That is our job. Number one job is ECE, right? The social emotional brain is forming during those five years, first five years of life. It is our job, our number one responsibility to these children to give them the tools they need to be successful adults, which means they learn how to regulate behavior. Self-regulation is one of the most important things children learn from zero to five, right? So when you have that adult who can't self-regulate, who just flies off the handle, loses their temper, doesn't know how to like keep, that's because they didn't, nobody gave them that before the age of five. So think about that. You, I want you guys to really go throughout your day, okay? And look at those people in your world that are really hard to deal with. The people who have very poor social skills, who just fly off the handle and lose their temper, who have horrible time management, um, who can't cope and just burst into tears. All of that, all of those things came from the first five years of life. And I'm sorry, there's a helicopter going over. <laughs> but all of that actually was produced in the first five years of that child's life. When they weren't given those skills they needed to be successful adults, that was all what we do in ECE. And that is why high quality research-based programs 
are so very important. And that's why like, I love to research, right? That's why the research is so important. When you look at models like Finland versus the United States, Italy versus the United States, and they can actually correlate the fact that what is going on in the preschool system and world really resonates even at my age, right? I have horrible time management skills by nature. So I've actually had to go back and really teach myself but, and I have to force myself to keep good time management, right? Because my nature is to have horrible time management skills. So I set out for years to learn better time management and I really have to work at it. And I still have to work at it, even though I have really good time management uh, techniques that I use and I, I've got systems down and I, I still backslide all the time and I have to keep myself aware, right? Because what I learned in those five, first five years of my life did not teach me time management. So now I have to work at it. It is constant work. Anybody who's been through anger management, it's the same thing. You didn't learn that in those first five years of life. When you really know what you're doing, right, in a classroom, when you have that classroom, and it is huge, you guys, it is, how is your classroom set up? What materials do you have? How many, do you guys regulate how many children are allowed in each center? How do you facilitate the learning? How are children talking to the, or how are the teachers talking to the children? Do you train your teachers on the kind of verbiage they're supposed to be using? How, what kind of language do they use? Um, how do they, you know, do they get down on their child's level? Uh, there's just so much. What kind of activities are planned? When your teachers are planning the activities, are they just opening up Pinterest and coming up with their um, curriculum based on what the popular thing on Pinterest is today? Or do they look at the children and say, okay, I am seeing that collectively my children are really struggling with sharing. So this week I'm going to find activities that focus on sharing. That's what should be happening. And that is what I mean when I say high quality standards. And let me tell you, when you see a classroom, that that transformation, right? Especially if you're used to going to like daycare and there's just, you know, a bunch of crafts put out there instead of, and let me clarify really quick. To me, a craft, if you have your art projects and it has an end result, right? Like, let's say you're making paper plate animals. Okay. That is a craft. That's not art. That's a craft. And that is not what's best for the children whatsoever. If that is what I call cookie cutter art, it isn't what's best for the children. The children aren't learning and growing. Every now and then, yes, they're fine. Um, I get it. Parents love it. And we still have to, you know, just, I call those parent pleasers. They're not really helping the children at all. But what does help the children is open-ended art. When you just put materials down and let them create, let them go. Let them, don't worry about the mess they're making. Don't worry about the end result. Who cares if they take googly eyes and put 20 on a piece of paper, right? Let them cut, let them glue, let them just be free and create. That is what quality looks like. Quality is not making little lion faces out of paper plates. That is not quality. That is just you pleasing parents. The children are not learning anything. And most of the time, they don't even really enjoy it so much. If you, if your children are rushing through art projects and if you have to force them to come to the art table to do art, yeah, you got you. it's all wrong. It's just the crafts that you're doing are not what's best for the children. And you really need help learning what, how do you come up with these things for the children, right? What kind of activities are you coming up with the children? When you're doing your curriculum, is that all you're really planning? Are those art projects or are you planning things that are really just engrossing the children? I can tell you like an example. The other day I was walking through one of my classrooms and my three-year-olds really caught me and they kept me in with them for a little while. And um, we were out on the playground and they brought me over to an ant hill they found. And these children, they were fascinated. I mean, we probably spent 20, 30 minutes staring at that ant hill talking about ants. So that like literally I went and immediately ordered them books on ants, their own little ant farm, um, and just found like as many learning materials as I, and I brought it to the classroom and said, here you guys go. Kids are fascinated with ants, teach them about ants. And now that is how children learn, right? We find what they're fascinated in and that is science right? They're fascinated with watching these ants. So now they have an ant farm in their room. They're reading books about ants. They're doing, they're studying ants. That is how children learn. And that also eliminates 
behavior issues because now they're engaged, they're not bored. The other thing is um, going back to what I was talking about earlier, where I asked you, do your children even know how many kids are allowed in a center, right? The other day I was in the same classroom, um, my three-year-olds and we were playing, what was it? Oh, we were playing in the Legos. And um, a bunch of the kids, when I come into the classrooms, they kind of flock to me. So, cause I am somebody new, you know, I may go in there a couple days a week, but I'm only in there for, you know, 20 to 30 minutes at a time. And I mean, for total in the whole week, I might be in the room for 20 to 30 minutes. So when I do come in, they kind of get fascinated and they want to drag me around everywhere. And I get this little, you know, herd that follows me. And so we went into, um, I read them a book and then I went over into their Legos area and there was like six of them. And immediately the children started like, oh, this center only allows two children. You got, there's too many of us here. There's too many. They start telling me the rules, right? Because they clearly understand their expectations. There were two new little girls in the room at the time too. And they automatically start telling these two girls, we only are allowed two here. We, we can't have, so when it's your turn and they're, you know, just automatically showing them how they know it's their turn, right? They're showing them the different techniques they use. They're showing them that there's only two. And we actually have X's on the ground with uh, duct tape that show them how many are allowed. And so the children know, they just know what is expected. We have visual cues. We've talked to them about their expectations. And also they know, I mean, our, that classroom probably has 12 different learning centers for them to choose from. So even if that's what they wanted, there's another center that's, you know, there's always something else for them to do. And there's more than enough choices. So those are the kind of things like that is what quality looks like. And that is why you can start eliminating more and more behavior issues. Now, of course, you're still going to have some children who need extra help, right? Because there are going to be developmental issues, there can be, you know, special needs that come in, there can be traumatic experience happening at home, there's so many different things. But for the most part, if you've got like, I uh, one of the things I see all the time is, oh, the boys in my classroom, they're just running and they're roughhousing. It's because they're not stimulated. There is something that you are not providing those children in the classroom, right? I can tell you 90% of behavior is the adult's fault, always. Um, when I first started training this, my staff would get so upset with me because they always want to blame the children. And I see this on your guys' Facebook comments and posts all the time, where it's just like blaming the children for behavior, blaming the children, but it is not the children's fault. 90% of behavior is the adult in the situation's fault. And we can avoid it. We can help them if we just really learn what is this behavior saying? Every behavior is telling us something. Every behavior is a cry for help. So when that just means they need a skill to learn, right? They, there's a skill that is lacking that we need to teach them. So once your staff is trained on how do you find that? What does this mean? What is the child trying to tell me? You can avoid behavior issues. You stop them before they start right? When your classroom is set up correctly, that acts as a third teacher. I can tell you, if you guys have children running around your classrooms, it's because your classroom isn't set up correctly. It's as simple as that. Uh, it drives me nuts whenever I see people and, it, and I kind of feel bad, but it drives me nuts. Also, I'll see people so proud of their centers and they post pictures and I just like, oh my gosh, really, really look at the bright colors. Those are horrible for the children. Look at how you have all the furniture up against the walls. That's terrible for the children. Um, when I took over zooming around my preschool and I walked in, I have um, major like ADHD issues and uh, I get so overstimulated really easily. And there was one classroom in particular that just, I, I had to walk in like this. I, I literally, I couldn't look at it. So I can't imagine what it was like for the children. It, I would get so overstimulated that I couldn't look at the walls. And when you walked into the classrooms, the walls were yellow, the floors are yellow there's this huge mur mural on the wall, right? So to a normal adult, they would walk in and they would just be like, oh my God, it's so cute. It's beautiful. Oh, wow. Look at the murals. Look at the bright colors. Oh, it's so great for the children. Mm -mm, it's awful. Awful. I'm sorry. For those of you guys watching who have the bright colors and murals, I'm so sorry, but it is awful for the children. It is so overstimulating. And, um, for an adult who does have ADHD and just different issues, uh, for me, it kind of stems from my narcolepsy, but you understand 
but that is how the children's brain works, right? So then it suddenly comes clear to you that like, wow, this is way overwhelming, right? And then um, I walked, the next classroom was orange and it had this beautiful mural again, but at least in that yellow classroom, everything was yellow. The chairs were yellow, the table legs were yellow. It, oh, it was just awful. Um, and then my last classroom was red and it had red chair, everything. And we had one child in particular who had some huge, huge behavior issues. And um, she'd actually been zooming around before I bought it, went to my new or my center, left them, came to me at my other center. And then when I took zooming around over, had to go back. When I had a behavior specialist in, she actually got me a grant to paint all the classrooms to get the busy colors out because behavior specialists understand that yes, red actually makes children angry. And that's exactly what was happening to this child. She would actually lose her temper and just really like destroy the classroom. And just, I mean, she, it was just terrible because, and that's exactly she, uh, everybody was thinking she had oppositional defiance disorder, but, uh, I mean, it was bad. She was throwing furniture. It was really, really bad. And when I had the behavior specialist come in, she said, it's, the, the colors in your classrooms are horrible. And I knew it overstimulated me, but I also know I have a neurological disease, right? So for me, I was just like, oh, it's my, you know, but then, um, and I don't know, I forget like a lot of times too. So when she really explained to me, like, think about it, 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 this is so overstimulating. This is why your classrooms have behavior issues. So we actually got a grant to paint all the classrooms, all of them. And uh, we basically made them a very soft blue and beige, very like just subdued colors. Uh, what's ironic is yellows. Like I, I don't think you guys can see it, but like my wall behind me is yellow. It's a very soft yellow. Yellows are calming to adults, but they are overstimulating to children. Um, I actually took a college class after this happened that was the psychology of color. And it really explains how like the child's brain, a, an entire semester, you guys, on how color affects the human brain, right? At all different stages of life. And it's kind of ironic because we always choose these soft, we choose yellow for nurseries all the time, right? For adults, it does calm them. So it's great color for your lobby. It does help them feel calm and relaxed, but for a child, way overstimulating. Colors in general, you have to be really careful for. That's why I go went ended up going for very soft blues, greens, and beiges because those do show that they calm. And I mean, really soft. I don't know. Um, I can show you guys really, uh, let's see. I'm going to move my camera and you guys have probably seen this blue before. If you've watched my other videos on that wall there, you see my blue, that blue would actually be too dark for the children. That's actually too dark for children, it's very soft and subdued. So I'm so sorry, you guys. I always feel so bad when I'm coaching different clients and they're telling me about the behavior problems or whatever they have. And then they show me these bright rooms with these huge murals. I'm like, oh God, those are horrible for the children. So sorry if that's what your center has, but if you really want what's best for the children, get rid of the murals, get rid of the bright colors. You want the child's art and you want it down at their level so that they can walk up to it and see it. it if you guys have artwork, that's like up here, like here where it's eye level with me. If you have bulletin boards, anything, that's not for the children. It's okay to have those, but just know that those are for the parents and for the teachers, not the children. So if that's where you're hanging your child's artwork, it's not for the children. It's for the parents and the teachers. If it is going to be for the children, it's going to be at their eye level. So honestly, your decorations in your classrooms that are there, and it should be their artwork. I mean, it really should be. It should be at their eye level and anything above eye level. Think of it in terms of that is for the adults in the room. Anything at their eye level, that is for them, the children. So if you don't have anything at their eye level, you have bright walls, all your furniture is up against the walls. You probably need some help with your quality control. So sorry, brute reality. Sometimes I can be brutally honest, <laughs> but basically there's just so much that goes into quality, right? There's so much. It's how you talk to the children. Another example I'll give you guys, and I'm going to wrap it up really soon is my teachers are not allowed to say the word no to the children. And I know they're not allowed to say no, they're not allowed to say stop. And whenever I tell people that on the surface, that sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? If you just came into my center and I told you, you're not allowed to say no, and you're not allowed to say stop to the children. Most people assume that that means we let the children get away with everything and that they can just do whatever they want. But that's really not the case. What it is, is that we 
I, I want to make sure that everything my teachers are doing is based on a place where they are facilitating a child's learning, right? And so if they have a negative behavior, if you want them to stop that negative behavior, you have to give them a replacement. See, the other reason why timeout is not allowed in my center. We do not use timeout. It is absolutely not allowed because at the end of the day, what I want you guys who do use timeout, I want, to, I want you to ask yourself is, what did I just teach the child? What skill? What? Okay, yes, you told them that they can't do what they did anymore, right? But what skill did I leave that child with so that they can replace this negative behavior with this positive behavior, right? Timeout teaches them nothing. It just teaches them what you don't want, but you're not giving them any skills to show them what you do want. And that is most important part. Children innately want to please adults. They don't like being in trouble. They want attention and they wanna please adults. So when you're looking for what is the function of this behavior, and how can I teach the child a new skill so they can overcome it? What is timeout teaching them? It does nothing. What is yelling no, telling a child? What is saying stop, telling a child? Sometimes I get you're going to have to do things like that to keep them safe, right? But it doesn't have to end in no. And that's why we banned the words no, stop, and timeout from my classrooms because it's not teaching anything. Instead, now, if I have a really seasoned teacher, and I do have a few that really know what they're doing, you might hear them say, please stop doing that because it is safer to have your CV on the ground and da, 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 right? Always have to come from a place of replacing this behavior with what you would like to see and explaining why. Uh, one of the things I tell my staff all the time is um, you're going to constantly be talking. In a quality classroom, you never stop talking. You never stop explaining yourself. We are literally explaining ourselves all day long. And the way I like to think about it and how I taught myself this concept years ago, I mean, over 20 years ago, is um, I always think of it as if I was an alien on a different planet, right? And everything around me was new. A tree is new. I've never seen anything like a tree in my life, right? Let's say I'm an alien here. Everything is new. I don't know how they talk. I don't know how they eat. If you ever <laughs> watch the movie Coneheads, kind of think of in those terms where the, the things that they do, what it, it's so different than what we do as humans, right? You're going to need that guidance, someone to show you what is acceptable, what isn't, how do I behave, what are these social norms? I mean, you guys, we could go to different nations right now, and that would be the customs are so different, right? What is rude in the United States may not be rude somewhere else, and vice versa. But think of yourself, it's, it's even better to think of yourself as an alien because we forget a three-year-old has only been on this earth for three years, right? And in their infancy, they were learning basically just that base, very basic human connection. So they don't know and they don't understand how, what is expected of them. They don't know what this world has to offer and it is our job to teach it. So think of yourself as an alien right here, everything is new. How would you guide? What kind of guidance would you like someone to give you? And that is what you give these children. We are literally teaching them how to be the humans we want them to be, right? And this is going to last for the rest of their life, which is why it is so, so important. I cannot stress you guys how important this is. So if this is something you guys struggle with, please let me know. This is part of one of the big pieces of my business. Um, like I, I was telling you guys, Prana Richards is now working with me. She, I can help you guys. Uh, she does teach monthly. She is helping coach some of my um, members. If you are a member and you really need to work on this, I can arrange for you to start working with Prana. It is so very important. So if you guys realize, like if you have the business end of things, just perfectly intact, but you realize that this is where you really struggle. If any of this resonated with you and you realize like, I am not giving the children what is best, right? I am using cookie cutter art. We have huge behavior issues. I don't know how to set up my classroom. I don't understand that um, facilitation of learning should be happening all day. Uh, I don't understand why screen time is so bad for children, um, which is another huge pet peeve of mine. I'm not going to get on that soapbox, but uh, 
message me, let me know. I would be happy to talk to you, explain to you more about my membership, how it works, um, how we can help with that. I would love to just really help you more in that area. Uh, the other thing too is uh, on Thursday, I do have my workshop. I still have some seats available for uh, how to organize your child care center's managerial system. And it's not just management, I'm talking teachers too. Like what is your hierarchy? So if you're really having a hard time delegating with your staff, um, if your staff really isn't meeting your expectations, uh, if they don't really understand their role, like you may think they do, but if you're having a hard time delegating and getting tasks done, they may not understand their role. If you don't have job descriptions or an organizational chart, you need the seminar. So let me know. I'd be happy to get you into that. And also last thing is tickets are on sale for my conference in October, which will be in Reno, Nevada. So you guys will see more about that. I won't waste your time with that now, but I hope everybody has a beautiful rest of your day. And, um, I hope this really helped somebody and we can improve more classroom quality through this message. Have a great day, everybody.